Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is a, a uh, presentation on the challenges of making local history documentaries. And I'm Russ Fry, and I'm from Burlington, Iowa. And I'm a retired community treatment coordinator for community corrections in Burlington. And my master's is in social sciences with an emphasis on history and psychology and sociology. But after I retired, I switched my interest back to history, and I've been writing books and making documentaries about local historical events, uh, local to southeastern Iowa, west central Illinois. So there's a collection of uh, my books, and I model my books after Arcadia Press. They use a picture caption format, so I make my books that way gathering up photographs to move the story along. And I do make documentaries, Ken Burns style documentaries. Uh, uh, anybody who's an historical documentarian knows Ken Burns. Ken Burns, in my estimate, estimation, is the best historical documentarian. In his documentary, The Civil War, he uses a lot of actual historical pictures and he zooms and hands on them to give them some life. A line of hills overlook Fredericksburg, Virginia, a key Confederate transportation link midway between Richmond and Washington. Union General Ambrose E. Burnside's plan had been to cross the Rappahannock by pontoon, occupy the town, then take the thinly defended heights. Bold action did not come naturally to Ambrose Burnside. Though he had led his men to Fredericksburg, determined to display the fighting spirit his predecessor, George McClellan, had so conspicuously lacked. You can see the pan and the zooming there. Ken Burns' picture style documentaries are not common at film festivals. You're more likely to see interview based documentaries where somebody's interviewed and then the editor will go through and put the story together. And if they use a narrator, the narrator will fill in holes and uh, tie it all together. Now, the History Channel, on the other hand, frequently use reenactors rather than historical photographs, or they mix them together. And reenactors is the proper term, but we would just could just say actors. The History Channel also uses file footage for their documentaries, for example, World War II battle scenes and. and I have in one of my documentaries, Sarah Welsh Nossman, who was a witness to the theft of Black Hawk's head. Mm. And Black Hawk was a stock war leader. Now, what would the History Channel do? Well, the History Channel would probably have an actress play the role of Sarah Welsh Nossman. However, I spent a good six months tracking down this photograph, which is the actual photograph of Sarah Welsh Nossman. And from a historian's point of view, that's much, much more valuable. Sarah Welch Nossaman was staying in a small town near Black Hawk's grave. She reported many years later that on July 3rd, 1839, on a starlit night just before dark, I saw Dr. James Turner mount a large bay horse with a bald face, and heard him swear that he would have Black Hawk's head before daylight the next morning. Poor quality visuals are not uncommon in documentaries of local history. If you do a, a documentary on the Civil War, you're going to have a whole bunch of pictures picked from. But if you're doing it on a local history, you're lucky to get fine photographs at all. So you may not have many to choose from. And this is an example. I have a book on Black Hawk Rock. It's a rock that the, the sock coordinator stood on and counsel for war. Well, this is a 1900s photograph of it. It's not very good quality, but that's what I'm stuck with uh, when you're dealing with local history documentaries. Your doctor, this is actually what a film festival uh, judge told me one time. Uh, she said, your docu documentaries are too much like a lecture. Well, I took that to heart and I learned some things to jazz it up. But this really is not an insult because a documentary of any kind is to be informative and expository. 
uh, you explain or describe an event or something that's going on. And the emphasis really is on narration and other verbal material. And what's visual is added to augment it. So it's essentially a, it is a documentary, uh, much like a lecture. Now, what do I do with my documentaries? Well, uh, I used to sell them on, on Amazon, uh, but they, they quit that service, so I'm not doing that anymore. Uh, my DVDs and documentaries were not very profitable. They cost more to make than a book, and they don't sell as well. People who are interested in local history would rather have a book, I think, than a documentary. Most of my documentaries can be seen on my YouTube channel, and that address is rfry52601. Russ Fry, 52601 is a Burlington zip code. <laughs> okay, now, I like to enter film festivals. Uh, this is my sixth year, I think, at Bare Bones. We also have a local documentary, uh, or local film festival in Burlington, and I, I've had one in there uh, every year for 10 years. And uh, part of that is local boy makes good, I think. <laughs> uh, anyway, I also like to do lectures, and I will sometimes uh, do an introductory uh, presentation and then show a documentary. And so this is, uh, you can see that's a pretty good sized crowd. Very good. Uh, turning out, I don't remember what I was showing. But. Okay, now what's very important for local history documentaries is then and now pictures. There's a, a limited audience for historical documentaries. Not everybody's interested, even in their own history. But one of the things I've discovered is if you show a picture of some spot, that uh, a historical event took place and then show what it looks like now, people who are not necessarily interested in history will say, I know that spot. And, and, and that captures their attention, but it also gives them a connection to their past. Because they can say, this happened here. And this is an example. That's 1840s painting of Burlington, Iowa. And that's a picture <laughs> of the same, taken from the same cool. spot. So, uh, yeah, cool. It is cool. People like that. Now and then pictures do not appeal much to people who are not familiar with the now picture. I could show you a empty parking lot and then show you where it looked like when there was something going on at that location and you go, hold on, you know, if you don't know the location. So, so that's, that's something that uh, uh, is a downside or a challenge for making local history documentaries. Now, the biggest issue is money, right? Okay. And, and, we, and this would be something to talk about uh, during Q&A after this. Uh, but my experience with with document well with filmmakers is that they they start off making cheap films or inexpensive films we'll say it that way uh, and then as they progress they spend more and more time raising money and when they do that though they raise the quality of their film uh, but they're spending less time uh, filmmaking and more fundraising now there are funds available from like in, in Iowa, Iowa Humanities, but over the last 10 years or so, they've been having less and less money. And it seems like the money kind of goes to more established uh, artists. Now, Bare Bones, uh, in, in their webpage will say, our philosophy is to promote and support efforts of the small budget filmmakers and producers. And I'm so grateful for that because I am a very low budget <laughs> documentarian. But even bare bones has a million dollar upper limit. Right? And I'm making films for under a thousand dollars. And and it shows to some extent because my my production quality is not as good as if I were spending thirty thousand dollars and had a full crew. Okay, uh, but now I have a documentary called a tour of Bluff Road. Now, I would have a very difficult time raising money for something like this. Bluff Road in Burlington is a one-mile road 
that was cut out of the side of a bluff to, to speed things up. Uh, and who's going to give me money for this? Probably not even burning ponies. But here's what the people are missing. If you walk Bluff Road, you'll see a pile of limestone blocks. Most people don't even pay attention to it. If they do, they don't give it a second thought. But look what it was. It was there was a natural spring out of the side of the bluff that filled a watering trough for horses. Now that's just amazing as far as I'm concerned. Uh, people miss out on that kind of thing uh, if they don't make documentaries of it. And then this little ravine, about a half a mile away, the conflict we call the Black Hawk War was launched from that ravine in 1832. Just think about that. The last war in the Old Northwest was launched from that ravine. Okay, my books are popular in my area and they support all my projects. So I sell a book, I got a little more money for my next documentary. Uh, my, my documentary on, on Black Hawk's final resting place, which won the uh, Native American Spirit Award here uh, five years ago, six years ago maybe, I made for $500. And most of that went for uh, paying uh, some Meskwaki language people to do some work for me. Now, the difference between a book and a documentary is kind of interesting. A, a book, uh, you can read, you can study, you can turn pages back, you can stop and think. But a documentary has to be clear enough that people grasp it as it passes in front of them. Everything has to move the story along, line along. And sometimes you're going to have things that uh, uh, would be interesting to show in a documentary, but it, it's off task. And, but you can put that in a book. Uh, here's a perfect example. My book, Black Hawk's Final Resting Place, uh, uh, Black Hawk, Makatai and Shikaikai, uh, gave his last public speech in Keokuk, Iowa in 1838, and he died a couple months later. And it was translated into English and put in the newspapers. Okay, in the book, I have uh, a painting of Black Hawk, uh, and then uh, in the caption section, I've got his speech, which is really a fascinating speech, and it's valuable in itself. But look what I did in the documentary. Just eat the hell. Now, here's another example of what we've been talking about. It's a, a right around North Hill. Once again, North Hill is a, a neighborhood in Burlington, uh, but it's got an old history, so I, I made a documentary about it. You can see it's a silent movie, and the original the, 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 will have uh, music in the background. But what I did at the film festival was have a live piano player out on the stage who played just like a regular movie. And I thought it was worthy of an award, but the judges didn't, so what are you going to do? Huh? But you can see people in Burlington are say, I know that building, I know that parking lot. And then they get to see what that parking lot looked like 50 years ago or 100 years ago. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll now, uh, I take the 1800s uh, local historical event. I find an event that is very interesting, and then I spin it. And, that, and this, you don't have to worry about copyright, right? This is, uh, everything is in the public domain if you can get your hands on it. Uh, but I find something that's interesting, and then I spend at least a year researching it. Okay? Uh, my books and documentaries are all original. 
uh, uh, stories that I put together from different sources. Okay, so there, I'm, I'm collecting information from libraries and online and museums and putting the story together. Uh, Blackhawk's final work, this is, this is, I'm proud of this. Blackhawk's final resting place corrects 169 years of mistaken history. The, the, the history books have his remains burning up in a museum fire in, in Burlington in 1853. And I found out that he's actually in an unmarked grave in a cemetery in Burlington. Okay, uh, digitizing uh, is saving a great deal of primary sources. Newspapers are being digitized, books are being digitized. Uh, the uh, Burlington Hawkeye is the oldest continuously run newspaper in Iowa, though it's not hardly worth anything anymore. But uh, it's, it's digitized, and that makes it very easy. But then again, if I'm doing a story in La Harp, Illinois, I go to their library, uh, they have their newspapers all the way back to 1848 in a shelf in the back room. Oh. It's very unlikely that they'll be digitized before they rot. <laughs> and all that history will be gone. Uh, here's another, oh, this, one, this just tears me apart. Here's another example of history being lost. Okay, uh, Keokuk, Iowa, which is downriver from Burlington, uh, was an important his, a Civil War site. It, had, it was one of the largest Union hospitals in the nation, and it had five camps where sol Union soldiers uh, 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 rendezvous before they went down to the Western Theater. Well, I thought a good primary source would be looking at city council minutes because the city would have had to deal with all of these uh, 40 some thousand soldiers who passed through. Well, the clerk said we ran out of space, so we threw them away. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. I mean, why not call and say, uh, historical society and say, will you take these? But no, they threw them away. Uh, my my uh, documentary on Agency Road, here's a clip from that. So you can see that it's very important that things be started to be, the histories need to be captured now before some of these sources are gone. Now, when you make a documentary, there are visuals, photographs, artwork, and video, and then you have audio, audio which would be narration, voiceovers, and music. Okay, it, once again, Agency Road. The Burlington Route was originally called the Indian Agency Trail because it followed the path the Sauk and Meskwaki used to get from their agency to Burlington. It later became known as Agency Road. Indian trails often used the paths made by buffaloes because they followed ridges to avoid swamps and marshes as well as the spring and fall floods. Thousands of travelers crossed the Mississippi River into Burlington in the 1800s. Some were U.S. citizens, many were immigrants. In 1855, the flood of pioneers reached its peak when up to 700 wagons were ferried across the river each day. The occasions, uh, what if there are no authentic photographs or artwork? What if, what if the event is very interesting but it wasn't enough to attract an artist or, or Whatnot. Now, I guess there was another one of my documentaries, I haven't shown it here, maybe I should, uh, is uh, I, we had the first and last legal hanging in Burlington occurred in 1845. And I, my research helped me find where the gallows were. So I basically, I walked the route from the jail to the uh, place of execution and took photographs uh, and then the narrator was reading the newspaper account of the execution. Mr. White offered a most fervent and pertinent prayer calling upon God to shield youth then present as spectators from temptation and sin and ending their lives as those before them were about to do. Immediately after the prayer Stephen Hodges came forward to address the crowd. He was very much agitated. His address was so different from anything we anticipated from a dying man. Uh, and then, 
I had one of the judges, very nice lady, very competent uh, cinematographer, said, it's too bad you didn't use any photographs of the hanging. And I bit my tongue and I said, yeah, that would have been nice. But it would be another six years before photography even made it to Burlington. And that shows you that, that content, it's hard to be judged on the quality of your work if the judges don't have a historical perspective. You know? And it sounds like I'm breaking and not, uh, well, maybe I am. But, uh, <laughs> but film festivals can decide their own standards. But uh, one thing I do love about bare bones is in addition to looking for quality cinematography, they also want quality content. And you'll see that in their, in their choices they make. Now, uh, this was one, uh, the murder of William Martin, it's quite a complex story, uh, but there were, there was absolutely no paintings, no artwork. Uh, and so I tracked out the location of some, where some of the events occurred, and then I filmed on those spots with my narrator, and then uh, I, I also relied on uh, some artwork, and I hired an artist, and he worked real cheap. I mean, he only charged me $200, he could easily have charged me 5000 But sometimes for something like this, somebody says, oh, I want to be in a movie. And so they'll work chat. Uh, but, but here's an example of using artwork. We're in this unsettled state when one night, Tama, an aged fox chief, arrived at the trading house to inquire if his white brother had heard any news from the seat of war. He was accompanied by his wife and son. Tama had a town about three miles below the town on the Iowa side. He'd been a great chief and a noted scout. In the War of 1812, he'd given valuable assistance to Edwards, then governor of the Illinois Territory, and carried papers certifying to the fact and recommending Tama as a friend of the white man. He was kindly welcomed, and soon the silence of night brooded over the little settlement. Okay, so I had the whole movie was artwork. Uh, and one of the judges, I'm not knocking judges, but one of the judges said it would have been nice to have color uh, drawings. And it would have been. But that guy, my artist, would probably not have accepted the, the, the job. Uh, and if he did, it would have probably been $10,000. That was all black ink on white paper that he could do fast. Some of it was even pencil. Okay, now, uh, we go over here. Uh, of course, there was no video in the 1880s, but it's always good to throw in some video, right? Ken Burns does it with interviews. Let's travel the Agency Road and discover its history as we go. The road began near what was then the western edge of Burlington and went up a ridge between two large ravines. Some of it's been abandoned, some of it now is country roads. But once I had that, then I put a dash cam in the, in the truck and then drove it and then weaved in all these pictures. Okay, this documentary, now this is important. If this documentary survives 100 years, everyone will find it fascinating. And that's worthy of another presentation sometime is the preservation of these uh, documentaries and other films because the technology will change and, and, and your, your film has to be updated somehow. But this, what I'm gonna show you here, is uh, William uh, Herbeck filmed Vancouver from the front of a trolley in 1907. Thank you. 
past. Okay, it shows you what it's like there. Now, what I try to do with my local history documentaries is show people what things look like now, and then put in, when I go past a certain spot, put in what it looked like in the 1800s. So people now can look at it and enjoy it, but 100 years from now, people go, oh my God, look, they were still driving cars. <laughs> you know? <laughs> this kind of thing will be a window to our, our, well, you said it earlier, our current will be somebody's uh, past. Okay, uh, and then you can always have a video of the narrator. Then once again, William Martin. A few years before the war began, Tama had moved his village here, a few miles north of Shaka Khan on the edge of a prairie near the river. So I, I, I found out where everything was, which is no small task, but I love doing it. But then I would go film at those locations. Now, a uh, video of it, you can use, uh, Ken Burns will have an expert uh, and interview. Most of my stuff is scripted because I'm trying to present exact history, but occasionally uh, I'll do something that involves an expert. And in the murder of William Mark, or uh, Eunice Rockefeller would show here, uh, a, um, Edward, Hen Edward Henry Rockefeller, a former marsh uh, city marshal in Keokuk, murdered Eunice Rockefeller, and there was a uh, they dropped it from murder one to manslaughter. Well, should they have done that? Robert Glazer, a retired assistant Iowa Attorney General, studied the Iowa laws that were in effect in 1864, the eyewitness accounts of the crime and other court documents. An evaluation of the evidence is that Mr. Rockefeller shot Eunice Rockefeller in the back as she was running from him. He admitted shooting her. There is an eyewitness who observed the shooting as Eunice ran. The defendant armed himself, shot his wife in the back as she ran away. This clearly shows willfulness, deliberation, as well as malice of forethought. In applying the code section of the time to the evidence set forth in the minutes of the grand jury, it would seem that all of the elements of first degree murder had been met. Evaluating this evidence with the law, it would be my opinion there was sufficient evidence to convict the defendant of first degree murder. Okay, and just by the way, off the cuff here, that's the same courtroom where Edward Rockefeller was sentenced. If you make a documentary on local history events, you may be the only expert. <laughs> it remains unknown whether or not John D. Rockefeller actually helped Edward as told in the family story. However, someone had to pay for Edward's expensive attorneys, and John D. is the most likely candidate under the known circumstances. A lot of times, I will hire a radio personality as my narrator because they've got good equipment. They, they got good egos, which will mean that they'll work cheap. Uh, and this is, this is one of our local radio personalities. Scene 01. We have a family story. It involves jealousy, murder, Confederate soldiers, and the richest man in American history. Uh, so I, I use him and another DJ a lot. And then uh, also we have uh, voiceovers uh, where he, a photograph of somebody, well, Sarah Welch Mouseman, you saw her earlier. She, uh, we had a hire, well, they didn't hire, I found an actress who was willing to, to do that for free. A lot of people will do things for free to get in the movie. Uh, they were Black Hawk. Black Hawk was buried by his family and friends, according to his wishes, on the farm owned by James Jordan. 
Blackhawk was buried in Davis County, Iowa, on the Des Moines River bottom, about 90 rods from where he lived when he died. That was on the north side of the river. I have the ground on which he lived for a dooryard. It'd be in between my house and the river. The only mound over that grave was uh, some puncheons split out and set over the grave and then sod it over with bluegrass, making the ridge of about four feet high. A flagstaff about 20 feet high was planted at the head, on which a silk flag was hung there until the wind wore it out. My house and his were only about four rods apart when he died. He was sick only about 14 days. He was buried right where he sat the year before when in council with the Iowa Indians and was buried in a suit of military clothes made to order and given to him in Washington City by General Jackson with a hat, a sword, and gold epaulets. James Jordan. And, and in music, uh, you could get stuff online. Uh, in this case, I hired some musicians local musicians, they were pretty cheap, uh, and they also gave me a paid-up license to use it in any number of documentaries. Hey, now, a low-budget local history documentaries are bound to be good for no other reason than they're just making a, a a history of something that happened in your area. Now, that may not be uh, good in the way that a film critic thinks of being good, but you're going to, you will preserve important uh, history that would otherwise be lost. <laughs>